streets like these, warehouses rising above endless rows of hideous houses, factories built over gardens, no space for playgrounds, churches tucked away behind railway arches, streets like these must have no place in the post-war Britain. Homes that were built without thought of the consequences, made even worse by firebomb and high explosive. This is what Bermondsey in South London looks like today. It is typical of cities all over Britain. But the people who live there may want to live here again. What is wanted are new homes and gardens right here. Can a big town be replanned so that the kind of homes which are usually found on the outskirts can be built in the centre too? Of course it can. And here is someone already doing it. It's true, it's only a model they're making, a scale model of this same part of Bermondsey. The London County Council has made a plan for the whole of London, parts of it built as a model, which shows exactly what the plan will look like. Here they are, planting trees round the open spaces, which must be a feature of the new London. Look at that new waterfront with its warehouses spaced out to give working room, with access to the river bank for all the people who live so close to it. Parks and recreational buildings are planned along these river banks. Gardens are being planned for the blocks of flats as well as for the houses alongside of them. This new layout does not ignore the past. It reveals it. Fine churches, damaged by the blitz, are to be restored and properly sited in open surroundings. This model is not just a toy built for the amusement of experts. Its purpose is to make the plan for a new London easily understandable to those who will live there. People come and look at it. They can see at once how a crowded district with warehouses and offices can be made pleasant to live in, how there can be space and sunlight good-looking houses and factories which are good to work in without overcrowding. Men and women in the forces can see the kind of homes and workplaces they hope to have. Children look at the fine schools and playing fields nearby. Businessmen at the new commercial buildings. Housewives and newly married couples inspect the layout in miniature of homes and shopping centers of the future. Behind this model, are the brains and experience of the planners and the architects who know that it can become reality, who, if given the chance, can wipe out what is bad of the past, preserve the best, and build cities everywhere worthy of our children. These are bundles of patches being sent out from the GPO London to repair the trousers of thousands of British post women. They call their trousers Camerons, and here's the reason why. I'm Jean Cameron, and my mother's the postmistress at Glen Clover, Scotland. At first, I didn't have a uniform, so I went my round in my ordinary clothes, and trousers seemed more sensible than a skirt. Then one day, the district postmaster rang me up. I'd asked for a uniform, and he thought I'd forgotten to send the measurements for the skirt. But Mr. Mack, I said, I don't want a skirt. It'd be no use to me in my job. And I told him just why I had asked for trousers. You see, I go 15 miles a day with the mail. I use a cycle, but where there are no roads, I have to walk. There are dikes to climb, rocks to be got over, and very often I have to cross the river Est. The mail, you see, even in this lonely glen, has to go through. Here is Mrs. Shaw. It means a lot to her to hear from her daughter, who's a nurse in Edinburgh. And here's Mr. Scott, the minister, whose son is a prisoner of war. I like to hear how he's getting on, because when I was very small, he used to take me to school in his car. It's a rough road I have to go. Pleasant enough in summer, but in winter it can be very unpleasant. This is the school I used to go to before the minister's son started taking me to school in town. But I always came back to the glen. Everybody is friendly here, even the wildest looking. I don't think it tough. I was born here, 
And although my life might be thought lonely by townspeople, I love to be amongst my mountains and my own folk. Often, the mail is no more than the morning paper. But remember, wireless batteries are difficult to get charged in this far-off glen, and the paper is still the first to bring the news. So now you see why it was a pair of bricks that I needed most. And miles away in London, the head office agreed with the Highland Postie. And one day, something happened in that lonely glen of mine. The mail arrived as usual, but this time it brought my uniform. I could hardly wait to see it. The first thing I saw as I undid the parcel was that I had won my point. For the first time, a Postie had been issued with trousers. The Cameron had come. No wonder I was excited. What I was doing now, thousands of posties would be doing later. But I was the first, and I shouldn't be a woman if I wasn't pleased to be the first to start a fashion. And so it was Jean Cameron, a Scottish postie, who started an idea which now affects the 16,000 postwomen of Britain. These are the fires and explosions of a major attack on Germany by the RAF. How much damage was done? That's what Bomber Command wants to know, and this is one way of finding out. Before every raid, the target is photographed. After the raid, it is photographed again. Here are the World's Fair buildings at Leipzig, used as factories and as they are now. You remember the Mona Dam raid? Before and after. Here is an aero engine factory in enemy occupied territory before the RAF arrived. And here it is after. Cameras are the eyes of the RAF. They are as vital as guns or bombs, and they are made with the same care and precision. From rough aluminium castings, the cones of the cameras are machined to specification. Great care is needed in checking these cones because they house the all-important lens. It is the lens which magnifies the object to be photographed, sometimes from miles above, and reflects the image onto the sensitized film. Craftsmen have taken over the job of fitting the lenses. This man was once a jeweler. He now finds a wartime use for his peacetime skill. The body of the camera, like the cone, is a rough aluminium casting. When it has been machined to the right size, it will hold the intricate mechanisms controlling the shutter gear and film. These mechanisms are fitted on an assembly line to speed up output. The camera gears are electrically driven. Here is the shutter mechanism under test. Each camera is built to hold 50 feet of film and the shutter is designed so that 125 separate pictures can be taken without reloading. The mechanism exposes a part of the film, winds it up, and then exposes another part of the film every two seconds. For a final check on the cameras, a selection is made from the hundreds produced each week. These go to the laboratories of the aircraft inspection department. They are tested against a chart. This checkered pattern of black and white squares is a tough test for any lens. The most minute hairlines must register on the finished photograph before the lens can be okayed for service. The result of this test is checked with a master plate to make sure that every part of the lens is perfect and in focus. On reconnaissance planes, this type of camera is fitted to specially prepared bomb racks. Through the portholes in the bomb doors, the cameras will look down onto the war plants of the enemy. The eyes of the RAF are in position. The pilots will bring back proof positive of damage done or search out new targets to be smashed. 